Beloved brothers and sisters, what a joy to be able to worship the Lord with you once again. What an incredible privilege it is for us to come together, even virtually, uh, to worship the Lord and can still grow in our faith, in our hope, in our love, even during these difficult and uncertain times. It demonstrates how our God is still with us and how our God is in full control. Before we go to God's word, I just want to express a personal word of thanks to our church family. The past few weeks, even months, uh, we have received texts and emails and even calls on my, myself and our family and oh, how we miss uh, seeing and being with all of you. But your words of encouragement has really blessed us. And for that reason, we are, we are just so thrilled to continue doing God's work in our lives. So a heartfelt thank you to our church family. As we come to God's word today, would you listen as I read to you two portions of God's word. The first one is in James chapter 4 verse 6 to be followed by Luke chapter 18 verses 9 to 14. We're going to look at James 4 6 and Luke 18 9 to 14. James 4 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James 4, 6. And then Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. Also, he, that is the Lord Jesus, spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Oh, how we need, oh God, your light. Oh, how we need, Lord, your leading in every aspect of our life, more so now than, it, than, than even before. We need you, Lord, to speak to us. We need to hear from you so that we may walk in your ways. Would you do so right now as we look to your word? And we, for we are listening and we are ready to do your will. Bless us, for we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The year was 1986, the month of August. Two ships collided in the Black Sea off the coast of Russia. Out of the 1,300 passengers on both ships, over 400 died and many remained missing as they were hurled into the icy waters below. News of the disaster became more horrifying when investigators revealed the cause of the accident. It wasn't a technology problem, neither was it bad weather. Both ships had been in constant radio and visual contact in clear and calm seas. Each captain was aware of the other ship's presence nearby. Both could have steered clear of the other. But according to official report, Neither captain wanted to give way to the other. 
each was too proud to yield. And by the time they came to their senses, it was too late. Have you ever met a prideful, arrogant person? These are people who are always talking about themselves. It's all about them, their accomplishments, how smart and how wonderful they are. And if that's all there is, perhaps, you know, it, that can be tolerated. But the worst is yet when such individuals think that everything had to be done their way. The Bible is full of warnings concerning pride. The one that immediately comes to my mind is the scripture we read this morning in James chapter 4, verse 6. Actually, this is a quote from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 34, reminding us that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. As long as you are full of pride, as long as you are self-centered, as long as you think you figured it all out by yourself, God, in effect, is saying you're on your own. Not to expect, well, you're not seeking, and obviously you don't have, you can't expect anything from the Lord. And the worst of this, as you look into James 4, 6, is not only God allows you to go about it yourself, but in effect you become an enemy of God. You are resist, God resists you. That God, you're against what God is doing. I'm reminded of the Puritan pastor Benjamin Witchcock and what he says concerning pride. He said, none are as empty as those who are full of themselves. Can I say that one more time? None is as empty as those who are full of themselves. This morning, I would like us to look at two important spiritual principles. They are very straightforward, very common if you think about it, but they are incredibly critical, especially to the life of a believer. The two spiritual principles is as follows. First, watch out for pride. There is nothing that can cause you to stumble as quickly as that of pride. Watch out for pride. And secondly, I think this is a corollary, a connecting idea related to this first principle. Watch out for pride. Secondly, seek God's mercy. Seek God's mercy. We're going to look at these two principles using from the story that our Lord Jesus had taught us, specifically concerning pride and humility. There's a, this story is about two people who went up to pray, but only one found forgiveness. Only one came out receiving grace from God. What happened? Let's look at it together, shall we? Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. Verse 9 began with the reason for the story that Jesus is telling us in this passage. We're told that Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they are righteous. And they also despise others. Let's stop there for a few minutes. Don't miss this very important context of this passage. You see, there are those who were following and listening to our Lord Jesus, not necessarily believers, could be, but more than likely they are just interested and curious with the Lord Jesus and what he has to say. But an interesting characteristic is that they think they are right, and most likely they believe that they're always right. Perhaps they thought that they, they know no sin that they have done, at least recently, and perhaps some 
could have believed that they had not sinned at all. But that's not all. These same people, we're told, despised others. Most likely those that they think who are not like them. The word despise here means to treat with contempt, to look down on those who are not like them, who are not righteous like them. They hated everyone else. In other words, they think they are right and everyone else is wrong. What happens when such a person comes to God in prayer? That's what we're going to find out. Continuing in verse 10, the Lord Jesus then began to tell the story concerning two people. First, there's a Pharisee, a religious and law-abiding person. Then there's the tax collector, one who is completely the opposite, known to be corrupt, definitely a despised member of society. Both went up to the temple to pray. Look with me in verses 11 to 12. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. From the start, we're told that the Pharisee stood and prayed with, notice it says, with himself. That's a very interesting statement, that he is praying with himself. Uh, many scholars interpret this to mean that he was praying as an individual. It was not like a, a group prayer meeting, but he was praying by himself, as opposed to praying with others. But it could, and I think would most likely mean not that he was just praying by himself, but that he was praying about himself. You see the difference? That he was, everything in the prayer is about him. In fact, some people think that this could be translated, he was praying for himself. You know, it's not a prayer to God, but it's a prayer to himself. I think it's very likely that that's kind of what the Lord is referring to. And it's obvious. The Pharisee began by being thankful that he is not like other people. He went on to specify three categories of people. You know, it could be the extortioners are those who are robbing people. There are those who are, you know, the unjust, those who are evildoers, generally speaking. And don't forget those who are adulterers, the sexually promiscuous people. Many scholars believe this is a common vice list that people think of when they think of really bad people. We have our own list. You know, we would, our list probably would include like, I'm so thankful I'm not like Hitler. I'm so glad I'm not like serial murderers. Definitely I'm not like the prostitutes. Each one of us have that list in mind of which we are so thankful that we are not like them, for we are much better. The Pharisee started by speaking of things that he avoids, that he is not. And then he went on to talk about things that he has done, the pious practices in which he is engaged. He mentioned that he fasts twice a week. Now, that may not sound as significant or noteworthy until you look back to the Old Testament and be reminded that the Mosaic law required only one occasion for fasting, and that is during the Day of Atonement. God just required one day of official, so to speak, fasting for his people. And here is the Pharisee who fasts twice a week. And that is incredible. Imagine a person fasting at least 104 times a year. Definitely, the Pharisee went 
beyond what the law requires in this regard. I mean, I'm sure many of us uh, uh, are impressed, and boy, that's a good weight loss program in itself, of which the Pharisee could find great uh, uh, encouragement, but definitely to speak of his, his devotion and his piety, I doubt if anyone can compare to him. But not only did he went beyond what is required of fasting, he also went beyond that of what is required in tithing. In Deuteronomy 14.22, Moses prescribed that tithing is for three specific items, that of grain, that of wine, and that of oil. A tenth of all of this should be tied before the Lord. But notice what this Pharisee said. He said that he gives a tenth of all that I get, meaning every item. Luke 11.42 tells us that Pharisees practice tithing even on their garden herbs. Think about that. There are your, uh, what you call that, the, the, the small things, the mints, the, 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 the different um, uh, parsley, even those my, my, uh, small uh, uh, plants that they are tithing it religiously, so to speak. That is incredibly impressive, isn't it? This guy can do no wrong, at least it seems. But that's where the problem come in. You see, with this self-preoccupation and this sense of self-righteousness, there's absolutely no sense of one's sin. There is no sense or of a need nor a desire of a humble dependence on God. For if truth were known, he doesn't need God. Somebody else probably, but not so for the Pharisees. You see, he got it all together. To him, he had not sinned. Therefore, to him, he neither need forgiveness, neither he need anything from God. I just finished reading a fascinating book entitled The Road to Character. It is written by the New York Times columnist David Brooks. In his writings, Brooks observed the overconfident attitude of Americans today. He notices a, what he called a glut of self-esteem that is especially rampant today. He called this a magnification of self. And he gave several examples of this. When pollsters ask people from around the world to rate themselves on different traits, Americans usually supply the most positive self-ratings compared to the rest of the world. Another, although American students do not perform well on global math tests, the results shows itself, the American students are among the world leaders in having self-confidence about their math abilities. They don't rank high, but they think that they do. 70% of American high school students recently surveyed claim that they have above average leadership skills, and only 2% believe that they are below average. One last uh, example. The number of American high school seniors who believe that they are VIPs, very important person, in the 1950s, the percentage is 12. 12% thinks that they are VIPs. Fast forward to the 1990s into 2000, that number is now at 80%. 80% of American young people think that they are VIPs. That leads David Brooke to conclude that there's an abundant evidence that we have a culture that thinks nobody is better than me. Can you imagine living, working with people who think that they are right? 
that everything has to be done their way. That is the danger of pride. Principle number one, watch out for pride. But the story doesn't end there. It continues on. Look with me in verse 13 of Luke 18. You see, there's still yet another person. The Lord continues, And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Notice that this tax collector, we're told, stands afar off. Most likely, he is so embarrassed to be in front of anyone, he is hiding in some obscure corner of the temple, not wanting to draw any attention at all to himself. And even if he's in that corner, he neither raises his hands nor his eyes. In this case, before God himself, we're told that he beats his breast as an act of sorrow and mourning over his sins, clearly reflecting his sense of unworthiness to approach God. His total humility, his deep sense of repentance could not be more opposite from that of the Pharisee. This tax collector was clearly under great conviction of sin. You see, lifting one's eyes to heaven in prayer is a common uh, an acceptable form of prayer as we are looking up to our God, so to speak. But he could not even do that because of the sense of unworthiness. And we're told that he was beating his breast. In the Greek tense, it is clear that this action is not just a one-time event, but rather one that is continuous. It should be translated literally, he kept beating on his breast. Truly a sign of sorrow. And his prayer is simple. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The word have mercy literally means let your anger be removed. Even as he looks to God, the only thing he could ask for is that of forgiveness. For he recognized that he doesn't deserve anything else. He calls himself a sinner, and he can only throw himself on the mercy of God. A Bible scholar said it well. This tax collector was guilty, and he knew it. He asked for God's mercy because mercy was the only thing he dared ask for. You know, there are many examples of those who come to the Lord Jesus, and as they come before him, they start off, and in fact, that's the thing that they ask of the Lord is for mercy. We are told of the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15, 22, who begged for her daughter to be healed and she said to the Lord Jesus, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is severely demon-possessed. The mother knew that she could not heal her daughter. She was helpless. There's no way she can do anything about it. But if the Lord takes notice of him, grants mercy, something good may come. Matthew 17, 15 tells us of a man who fell at Jesus' feet, begging for mercy for his son. He cried out these words, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. The man was pleading for mercy to the only one who could heal his son. One more out of the many other examples, in Matthew 20, 31, two blind men called out to Jesus, crying out, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. It is so obvious that the blind man cannot heal their blindness. 
But Jesus could, and Jesus eventually did. You see, mercy is a response to someone in need. And don't miss that mercy is not just an act, but something behind that, that of compassion, that of love, flows out into such act of mercy, revealing that mercy responds to those who considers themselves helpless. In his novel, The Testament, John Grissom beautifully paints a portrait of a man's surrender to God. This man is Nate O'Reilly. He is a disgraced corporate attorney plagued by alcoholism and drug abuse. Grissom writes, after two marriages, four detox programs, and about with dengue fever, Nate acknowledges his need for God. Grissom describes the transformation. With both hands, he clenched the back of the pew in front of him. He repeated the list, mumbling softly every weakness, every flaw, every affliction, every evil that plagued him. He confessed them all in one long, glorious acknowledgement of failure, he laid himself bare before God. He held nothing back. He unloaded enough burden to crush three men. And when he finally finished, Nate had tears in his eyes. I'm sorry, he whispered to God. Please help me. As quickly as the fever had left his body, he felt the baggages left his soul. And with a gentle brush of, his, of the hand, his slate had been wiped clean. Nate breathed a massive sigh of relief. He was forgiven. This is what our Lord Jesus meant when he concluded the story in Luke chapter 18, verse 14, the Lord Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, the repentant, one who is begging God for mercy, went down to his house. He went home justified. He was made just. He was made righteous rather than the other the Pharisee, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. The Pharisee may have prayed the most dignified prayer. We would have applauded him. We would have been in awe of the Pharisee. He might have went home feeling good about himself, but according to the Lord Jesus, he went home no better in the eyes of God for his prayer. In fact, he went home the worse for it. For he not only had not received anything from God, but he should not expect anything either. The tax collector was quite the opposite. He who exalts himself will be humbled, but it is the contrite, the penitent sinner who humbles himself for God's mercy, who at the end found it. I love what David said in Psalm 51, verses 1 and 17. David prayed, have mercy upon me. There it is again. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. And verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Two spiritual principles. First, watch out for pride. Look for 
signs, indication in which you think that you had it all together, that you had no need, particularly even of God. Watch out for pride. Secondly, and I think this goes naturally with the first principle, if you watch out for, the, for pride, seek God's mercy. Pray that same prayer, Lord, have mercy on me. I wonder if you ever said that or how you feel if you were to say those words to God. Do you know that that statement, Lord, have mercy, is one of the most ancient and one of the most regular form of prayer personally and corporately throughout Christian history among different Christian groups. In the Greek, that statement, Lord have mercy, is kiri elison. Kiri elison. Kiri is Lord. Elison is have mercy on me. It is a wonderful spiritual exercise that we come before God, first of all, acknowledging Him as Lord, not our servant, not our someone who do our bidding. He is Lord. And what we need of the Lord is mercy. That's what we needed. God is not, you know, uh, indebted to us. He doesn't owe us anything. We owe Him everything. And in fact, we owe Him all of our faults and all of our transgressions for which we deserve his punishment. But we ask of him for mercy. For this reason, we're told again, coming back to James 4, 6, God resists the proud. God would not have anything to do. In fact, the proud would find God against him. But... For those who are humble, for those who call out for God's mercy, grace is available. Grace will be dispensed. What is grace? Grace is the enabling power to change. Grace is the enabling power to heal, to be able to be reconciled to be able to experience God's peace, to experience God's hand in your life. Someone described grace as the power to, to restore what you thought was dead. It is the key to unlock the power of God in your life. And it can only come as we humble ourselves and wait on the Lord's provision of grace to us. When we humble ourselves, in effect, we're saying, God, I need you. God, I need your help. And it is at that moment that God releases his grace, his power in your life. One of my favorite films is that of Amazing Grace, the story of the English legislator William Wilberforce as he sought to end British transatlantic slave trade in the 19th century. In one scene, Wilberforce visited his old pastor and friend, John Newton. Newton himself was a former captain of a slave ship prior to his conversion to Christ. Wilberforce was hoping that Newton would help him by giving account of his slave ship days. But Newton was reluctant because the experience and what he called the 20,000 ghosts haunted him greatly. It was so difficult and so painful to look back. But on a second visit, Wilberforce received from Newton a full account of his experience. With his eyesight growing weak, Newton said to Wilberforce, you must use all that I have written, names, records, uh, ports, people, 
everything that I remember is here. Although my eyesight and even my memory is growing weak, I remember two things very clearly. I'm a great sinner. Secondly, Christ is a great Savior. When all has been said and done, when at the end of our life, this too remains. I am a great sinner. Nothing can ever replace that. But thanks be to God that we have a great Savior in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if that describe your heart, as you come before him, as you wait on the Lord, as you depend on him, grace will be dispensed to you. God resists the proud, but gives grace. Do you need grace today? Do you need grace this week? Do you need grace for the days to come? Do you need grace in your family? Do you need grace in your workplace? Do you need grace for the future? We all do. And all that God asks of us is come near him in a sense of need and dependence. Not with a proudful heart, but that of a humble spirit, knowing that in ourselves we just could not help it and do it on our own. But if God, with, if the Lord is on my side, if the Lord is with me, there is hope and there is grace available in me. For God gives grace to those who seek it, who humble themselves before him. May God's grace be with each one of us today in the days to come because we look up to him and say, Lord, be merciful. Have mercy on us. Let us pray. Our gracious, our merciful Heavenly Father, thank you for once again tearing the facade of life from our eyes, being deceived by the devil, by the world, even by our flesh, thinking that we have it all together that we are good enough, such prideful attitude, O oh Lord, as your word said, lead it to destruction. But you love us so much. You're calling out to us, giving us example after example of those who receive grace from you. And it is those who had humbled, who have trusted you, who looked up to you. For when, when we do so, you will not hold back the gates of heaven, granting us that which can only come from you, your love, your forgiveness, your strength, your help. Lord, we are in uncertain and difficult time. None of us here, if there's one thing the pandemic reminds us, is how helpless and even how hopeless we are in ourselves on things that we hold on. May this be a reminder to call out to you, O God, and to seek your mercy. And in doing so, we may receive your grace. Let it be, O God, for we ask it in our Lord's precious name. Amen. Amen.